The scarcity of cartridge bags drove us to some strange makeshifts. During the bombardment, several tailors were kept busy making cartridge bags out of soldiers' flannel shirts, and we fired away several dozen pairs of woolen socks belonging to Major Anderson. This week on the 11th OVC, socks and stockings worn by federal troops during the Civil War. So socks were actually an intimate part of the federal soldier's life. Whether at garrison or on campaign, they were issued some, received others from home, and yet others from charitable organizations. This episode primarily focuses on stockings, which you'll see why in a little bit, with some details about socks as well. So the first thing that we actually have to talk about and identify and define when we are identifying socks is the actual anatomy of those socks. Uh, for instance, we have the ribbing and the leg, the heel, the gusset, the foot, the toe, and of course the gauge of the sock or the stocking. And of course, continuing with terminology, soldiers wore both half hose, which the army called stockings, and socks. On the other side, women's stockings were called hose and end above the knee. When men wore knee length breeches, shorter stockings covered their calves, hence the term half hose. By the mid 1820s, however, trousers had ended at the ankles versus much higher. And so the half hose, however, continued to be made by many households, many families. But by the mid-1820s, trousers started to end at the ankles, but many knitters continued to make the half hose. And these half hose that were commonly made only had about a three-quarter inch or less ribbing at the top. So because of this small amount of ribbing, that three-quarter inch or less, to hold up the garment, they were generally held up by a garter or sometimes a bootstrap or tying one's drawer legs over them or even by pulling the legs over the trouser cuffs. In the 1860s, socks and half hose were knit by both hand and machine. The ribbing, which looks like corduroy, reinforces the top of the sock leg and serves to actually hold it up. And stockings or socks with three quarter inch or less ribbing needs additional to support to stay up, thus garters. A period socks have about two to three and a half inches of ribbing, while modern socks are usually ribbed all the way down to the ankle. While one written pattern exists for an entirely ribbed nine inch sock leg, they're extremely rare to run across. The most common is that two and a half to three and a half ribbing at the top of specifically the socks. Measured from the top of the ribbing to the top of the foot, sock legs are usually seven and a half to 11 inches long, with the average being around nine inches. Half those are generally longer, varying from around 12 to 19 inches in length. So another thing that's interesting to note is actually hand-knit socks and half hose have ankles narrower than the top of the leg. They also have a seam stitch down the back of the leg. This stitch specifically is not where the sock is sewn together, but rather a way for the knitter to evenly decrease the circumference. Period machine-made socks and half hose do not taper or have these seam stitches. Their circumference is uniform the entire length of the sock or the half hose or the stockings, and this is because period sock machines could not manufacture heels or toes. Thus, the toes and heels were added by hand even after the machine made its part. The most widespread period heel is the shaped common heel seen here in this figure. It is identified by a seam down the middle. It looks uncomfortable, but when properly made, the seam opens like a hen with each step. Also frequently seen is the round heel seen in this picture. And knit and machine made socks and half hose even are seen having these hand knit heels and these hand knit toes. So another type of heel that you might see is what's called the short row heel. Uh, the short row heel was not a manufactured item during the American Civil War. This incorrect construction is often seen on alleged wartime period socks or authentic reproductions. In period socks and half hose, there is a gusset where the heel joins the foot and this slanted row of stitching begins under the ankle and points toward the toe. That's the details you are looking in an authentic period sock to tell the difference between a Civil War period or a mid 19th century period sock versus more modern period socks. Additionally, moving on to toes, the most common period pattern used to make sock toes produce the round toe, seen in this picture, the wedge toe, seen here, and of course, the three-point toe. 
If you're not familiar with the three-point toe, it can be recognized by three converging seams that meet at the sock's tip. Now regarding the gauge, again, if you remember terminology of the sock, the last one we mentioned was the gauge. A common gauge was around 8 to 12 stitches per inch, uh, with the lowest at 7 and maybe the highest around 18. However, machine-made socks and half hose have finger gauges averaging around 11 to 22 stitches per inch. With quality yarn and construction, higher gauge socks were sturdier and more comfortable and wearing longer before developing holes for the user, which is of course important on campaign. So now let's talk about the federal issue sock. Government socks were purchased from contractors in different states, of course, all throughout the country. Made to the quartermaster department specifications that changed slightly through the war, variation in issue socks resulted. The information we are currently going off of is compiled from government documents and eyewitness descriptions. Absent genuine artifacts, of course, questions will remain if you can't examine them, though some characteristics are known, and of course, we'll talk about that. So the federal government, or the quartermaster, uh, ordered both socks and stockings. Contracts with the National Archives show that between 1861 and 1865, at least 10 million pairs of stockings were bought. Let me say that again. 10 million pairs of stockings. Compare that to only 800,000 socks. The actual number is right around 849,326 stocks. So you have 10 million pairs of stockings that were contracted by the quartermaster. Compare that to 800,000 socks. That is a 10 to 1 ratio, and that's being liberal from stockings to socks. One collector speculated that as the army rapidly expanded, it became simpler to issue stockings to everyone regardless of footwear. The quartermaster often printed notices in newspapers soliciting clothing to meet their specific specifications. So these notices or general documentation contain interesting tidbits. For example, all notices state that the stockings are to be wool and weigh at least four ounces per pair. By 1865, the quartermaster specifications read the following. Stockings of all pure wool and yarn made with three threads doubled and twisted to have narrowed or fashioned toes and to be of three sizes, which are nine and a half, ten and a half, and eleven and a half inches long in the foot and fourteen inches long in the leg. For all three sizes, every dozen pairs to have five pairs of the smallest, four pairs of the medium, and three pairs of the largest size in it, and to weigh three pounds. So to the army, pure woolen meant 100% wool, cotton, linen, or blended fibers. Made with three threads also meant that three strands of yarn are to be spun together. Yarn gets stronger with each additional ply, however too many will make the sock too thick and to fit in the shoe obviously. Ordinary socks were customarily made of two ply yarns spun very tightly together for the smoothness and strength. Modern three-ply sport weight yarns are extremely too soft and fluffy for period construction. And when I say modern three-ply sport weight socks, that's talking about the modern wool socks used today, not the cotton socks. So today's fingering weight yarn is much closer to weight and texture to the 1865 specifications for army stockings. Because sock machines in the period could not make finished heels and toes, these were individually hand knit into the machine made leg and foot. That quartermaster specification states fashion toes raises the possibility that some early contractors tried selling stockings that were simply sewn shut across the toe making a square toe. That would be comfortable. So one of the things that's interesting about contractors that made these stockings or socks is, for instance, the contractors of Walter Aiken and Alva Soloway, who ran a Franklin, New Hampshire sock factory from 1859 to 1863 and instructed their workers to finish their socks with a round toe very specific to finish with, with a round toe. And they also specified that the heel and toe must be knit close and firm with a number 17 or number 18 needle. It gives you an idea of the thread they were using. The short row toe seen in modern machine made socks today is a product of a post-war machine knitting process and was not used in the hand knitting process until long or significantly after the American Civil War. 
These military contractors were to make their socks about 10 inches long and split the remaining order one quarter to be nine and a half inches and the other to be 11 and a half inches long. So again, your socks, specifically socks, not stockings, are right around you know, nine and a half, 11 and a half inches long, right around there, 10 inches long on average, if you want to say that. And this system of sizing apparently left the government socks so large that they wrinkle and hurt people's feet. So in studying this, one thing that was very interesting to me is that socks manufacturing was undergoing a technological revolution. Antebellum knitting frames produced a flattened item that had to be folded and sewn into a sock shape with seams along the side sides of the foot. By the mid-1850s, circular sock machines could knit a seamless tube of fabric. The addition of these hand-knitted heels and toes transformed this tube into a tightly knit stocking or sock. So before the war, the stocking industry centered around Philadelphia and nearby Germantown using knitting frames that produces stockings with seams. Starting in May 1864, the quartermaster would only consider those made on the new circular sock machines. Some older contractors converted to the new machinery while additional factories started up, opening up, I should say, in New York, Upper New England, and even the Midwest. So another interesting fact is that according to the 1865 specifications, the legs of federal issue stockings, again I'm talking stockings not socks, were to be 14 inches or more in length, which was about one half inch longer than the length specified for cavalry boots. Additional information about stocking legs can be gathered from the Woolsey family, uh, especially their correspondence with one another. Several Woolsey daughters were union nurses and their extended family made and purchased and shipped, supplied to them in huge huge volumes from New York. Upon hearing that department store owner Alexander Stewart was making socks for the army by machine, Mrs. Woolsey managed to obtain six pairs of the competition. She shipped these machine-made socks to her daughters, comparing them to hand-knit socks produced by the family and friends, and she said the following about those socks. Stewart, for instance, bought up all the yarn in the country and is having it knit up himself or is hoarding it in the third story. The brown socks in the second barrel are a specimen of Stuart's. They are made by him on a hand knitting machine. The toes and heels put in afterward entirely by hand. You see, they are stiff and shapeless. She later wrote asking them to compare the Stuart socks to the socks they had seen made by a second contractor. Please compare your Jew socks with those we send on. See if there are any hard lumps in the heels. I presume they are made on a hand knitting machine at 20 cents a pair, like half a dozen, which I had sent in the second barrel from Stewart's. They are as thick as a board and when washed, we thought they would be so stiff and thick as to be unwearable. So I suspect that the shapeless comment refers to the legs appearance. All the original hand-knit socks studied had a length which a larger circumference at the top than at the ankle. Stockings made on circular sock machines are a straight tube straight to the ankle, seemingly formless to Mrs. Woolsey. However, artilleryman John Billings wrote in regards to their shape that, quote, in symmetry they're like the elbow of a stovepipe. So during the stocking manufacturing process, weights are actually hung on the work in progress to pull it through the machinery. This stresses the yarn and produces a very stiff texture resembling almost cardboard. A quality supplier would have washed and shaped the stockings as it dried, relaxing the wool. Stewart probably did not wash or shape his stockings, of course adding to his profit because he didn't have to do as much work on each pair he sent out. So whether finishing a machine-made sock or finishing one entirely by hand, knitters usually made either the shaped common heel or the round heel seen here in these pictures. Modern machine-made socks have a short row heel seen here. These have no gusset, but rather a diagonal seam that points from the heel to the ankle. After the war, technological advances produced made machines that could completely knit the sock, both the heel and toe included. But keep in mind, the short row heel that we see in modern socks have no place in mid-19th century progression.
And the reason that it has no place is that the short row heel was the result of later technological advances. It was unknown and unpracticed by hand knitters until well past the war. So artifacts and reproductions purporting to be a federal issue with sock or stocking and exhibiting this heel pattern cannot possibly date to the mid 19th century, specifically the era of the American Civil War. Now, specifically talking about the yarn that was used, the contractors probably, or obviously most likely, uh, got whatever yarn that could meet the minimum specifications. Using undyed yarn in natural shades like cream, tan, brown, gray, or even black, they could actually make more profit if they didn't have to, quote, spend time dyeing them. So veterans typically describe the issue sock as gray or even blue. Of the two pair of federal stockings pictured in Francis Lord's Civil War Collector's Encyclopedia, one appears to have slightly darker heels and toes, obviously probably the result of hand knitters adding those after the fact using maybe scraps that they may have. In 1860, the government contracted for socks at $2.88 per dozen, and a year later, another contractor was paid $3.75 per dozen, obviously indicating the inflation of the war. Additionally, military regulations allowed soldiers to draw about eight pairs of stockings per year. Those issued more were charged about 20 to 33 cents per pair from their pay, which of course is right in line with the government purchase price. The deductions were powerful incentives to make stockings last or to seek better replacements from home or benevolent organizations. So in conclusion, federal issue stockings were more common than socks. They were machine made and finished with hand knit toes and heels. So something that was also interesting to note is that after May of 1864, their quartermaster did not accept them with seams along the feet. Army stockings had little or no ribbing and the straight leg with no shaping came in only three sizes and weighed about four ounces per pair. Again, when you're looking at the overall scheme of things, you're looking about four ounces per pair. They did not have short row toes or heels. So now let's talk about other suppliers of socks or stockings that the soldiers could get other than the eight issued ones. For instance, you know for sure that volunteers enlisted with at least one pair of socks from home. Where do they get other socks or stockings if they needed more. So after experiencing issue stockings, many rode home for socks. They paid dearly for them from settlers or sought them from privately funded organizations like the U.S. Sanitary Commission, the U.S. Christian Commission, and state or local aid societies. These charities distributed hundreds of thousands of pairs of socks and half, half hose or stockings to soldiers throughout the war. By 1862, Boston alone had donated 34,000 pairs to their soldiers. Organizations also purchased socks when necessary. Uh, some donors included extra yarn and darning needles for field repairs. Knitters sometimes place notes in their offerings, which one of my favorite notes that I've seen is a following note from someone who knitted their socks and sent them off to a dear young soldier in the field. My dear boy, I have knit these socks expressly for you. How do you like them? How do you look? And where do you live when you are at home? I am 19 years old, of medium height, of slight build, with blue eyes, fair complexion, light hair, and a good deal of it. Write and tell me all about yourself and how you get on in the hospitals. If the recipient of these socks has a wife, will he please exchange socks with some poor fellow not so fortunate? So basically with that young woman knitting that sock, if you're single, great. I love you. These socks are for you. Enjoy them. If you're already married, Give them to someone else. Yeah, kind of entertaining, right? But one thing that's also important to note is that, especially from these homemade socks or stockings, is that both hand and machine knit donated socks were made of wool, cotton, silk, and blends of all these fibers. They were predominantly blue or gray, but of course they could be of any color, as you can see in originals from the National Aid Societies, from the National Archives, uh, from the Smithsonian, or even the museum, the old Museum of the Confederacy, which is the Civil War Museum now. 
So many of these homemade socks had contrasting heels and toes or ribbing, other stripes, patriotic colors or slogans. Uh, the work of the ethnic knitters is actually kind of interesting to note is that they are extremely uh, easily identifiable by traditional patterns and colors. Uh, socks were often stamped with a charity or the charitable organization's name to ensure that contractors or no other uh, profiteers, if you will, uh, would be selling charitable organization socks to the soldiers so that's why they stamp their organization's name on it so it won't be sold for profit. So again, these socks from home often exhibited laundry marks, simple embroidered initials, cross-stitch into the top of the leg, uh, which are usually in a primary red or blue type colors, and occasionally the initials themselves were knitted into the sock itself. So additionally, W. M. McLean of the 32nd Ohio receiving mending supplies in a comfort bag through the Vicksburg Union Literary Association in 1863 wrote a letter to Miss Sarah Southworth saying the following. As for the thread and yarn, I must confess that soldiers have a very bad way of darning socks verbally and throwing them away. Also, that they generally subscribe to the maxim which declares a hole is more honorable than a patch, since the first may be the result of recent accident, while a patch shows premeditated poverty, with all the incentives to a better condition that I now possess. However, I shall endeavor to improve my state. So with all that being said regarding socks of the mid-19th century, and armed with the knowledge of the similarities and differences between modern era and Civil War era socks, both donated and federal issue, we we all can be aware and wisely judge the material construction and the details of mid 19th century socks, both artifacts and reproductions. As with any reproduction garment, a faithful reproduction and therefore a faithful wearing of this garment will bring one closer to the actual experience of those soldiers long ago. So again, we probably covered way more than you wanted to cover regarding Civil War and mid 19th century socks, but I hope this was a valuable uh, few minutes minutes for you. If you like this video, please like us on Facebook. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel down here. Uh, please ring the notification bell. And of course, until we see you in the field, ride on.